Welcome to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, Editor-in-Chief of Southern Living Magazine. And my final guest this year is a 23-year-old blues musician from Clarksdale, Mississippi, who has already won a Grammy. Chris Stone Kingfish Ingram started playing at a very young age, but it was a class at the Delta Blues Museum Arts and Education Program in Clarksdale that taught him the basic fundamentals of the genre. He cut his teeth as a young musician playing clubs like Ground Zero Blues Club and Red's Lounge when he was still in high school, accompanied by a very protective mom. And he eventually went on to play for huge crowds at music festivals, at one point opening for the Rolling Stones. Today on the show, Kingfish talks about his latest album, 662, the story of how he got his blues name, and what he learned being on the road with his mentor, Buddy Guy. All that and more this week on Biscuits and Jam. Well, Kingfish, welcome to Biscuits and Jam. Uh, thank you, brother. I'm happy to be here, most definitely. So, listen, I've got to start out by asking you about your name, or maybe I should say your blues name. <laughs> you were born and raised as Chris Stone Ingram. How did you come to be called Kingfish? Well, uh... I attended the Delta Blues Museum Arts and Education Program back home in Clarksdale. And two of my uh, teachers, who are also nationally known bluesmen, one of them, Bill Hallamad Perry, uh, he used to give all the kids in the class different nicknames. And we thought of them as stage names. I came in, you know, as a young child, you know, I was talking to Smag, and he said I reminded him of the character off of uh, Amos and Andy. So he gave me Kingfish, and it just stuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sure did. You're Kingfish to this day. So what does your family call you? Well, my middle name is Xavier. So all of my relatives call me this nickname I've had since birth called Xavier. So that's what they call me. Either that <laughs> or Chris. <laughs> right. You got a lot of names. Well, listen, tell me about Bill Howlin' Mad Perry, the guy that gave you your name. What are some things he taught you about the blues? One of the things that him and also uh, Richard Daddy, Rich Christman, another bluesman, they used to teach me a lot about control and pretty much like all the basic fundamentals of the blues, like the storytelling and try not to play too much, try not to bleed over another person soloing, just all the basic stuff. And whenever we would actually learn more about the drum and reel, put the instruments down and like go into these file cabinets and pull out blues stories and read them all in a circle. So it was truly a blues education class. Are you close with those guys anymore? Do you keep up with them? Oh, most definitely. Most definitely. One of them still lives in Clarksdale, Daddy Rich. So I talk to him almost all the time, like on Facebook or when I'm going to the museum to visit to see him. So yeah. Well, they must be pretty proud of what you've been able to do coming out of that place. Oh man, I hope they are. <laughs> it's because of them that I'm here. So yeah, you know, I hope they are. Yeah. So you're from Clarksdale, Mississippi, mm -hmm. which is about 90 minutes south of Memphis, maybe two hours. Although I've also seen references to Friars Point. Right. Did you grow up near Friars Point? Friars Point is uh, where I live currently, and I started living there in middle school. Okay. I consider it all to be the same because Clarksdale is the biggest city in Cahoma County. So to me, it's all Clarksdale. You know, some will definitely agree, but it's small. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about the the house and the neighborhood where you grew up. Well, the house and neighborhood I grew up in, Clarksdale, I would say that had the most significance because I lived in a neighborhood called Oakhurst, and right next to me was a blues band. So even before I like got into the Delta Blues Museum, I used to go over to the local guys' uh, house. They used to have juke joint parties, and they would let me in there, you know, while they would be drinking and doing what else. But they would be playing music like some of the local guys. You know, they were never big, known, anything like that, but they were legends in the in the community. Guys like Dr. Mike James, and we had a singer. His name was Razor Blade. He was a soul singer. All of these were, like, local blues legends who came to this house. So you were listening to the blues, I mean, real early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. So there's a lot of farmland down there and a lot of cotton and soybeans. And of course, there's just great blues music coming out of everywhere and going all the way back to Robert Johnson. Why do you think so much music has come out of that town? I think it just has something to do with the environment. 
you know, uh, so many blues guys worked for the farmer down there, you know, sharecropping and whatnot. And it was just a hotbed for different guys who did that. You know, so I think the environment is really what paved the way for that, for sure. Yeah. I saw you say somewhere that that a lot of your friends, when you were real young and you were interested in this kind of old school blues music, they would give you a hard time about it because they were listening to much newer music. Was it unusual for a kid of your age to be so into the blues? I think for them, it kind of was. I think they just had never seen somebody their age take a liking into like, as they would call it, Neanderthal music. But I would have to explain to them, like, this is our history, especially with all of us being from Clarksdale. Like, we come from this. It's part of our heritage. It's part of our blood. So it wouldn't be what y'all listen to now if it wasn't for this. So I try to explain that. They still don't get it, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) They'll come around. Right, right. So Kingfish, your family was very active in the church. And Mm -hmm. that meant a lot of singing, a lot of performing, a lot of music. Tell me about the church that you went to and, and how that influenced you as a young musician. Well, one of the churches that I attended the most, my mom's family church back home in Sardis, Sardis Mississippi, a church called St. Peter Missionary Baptist. And she would take me there to see different church programs. And, you know, she sung in a quartet group herself with my family. So that's what she would take me to. And then that was also another church a little bit down the road from Clarksdale called Tutwiler, Mississippi. That was a church that I, like, officially started playing for called Faith Temple. So all of that was definitely a part of the bring-up as well. There would be certain nights we would play Reds and Clarksdale on Saturday and head to Tutwiler that Sunday morning. (laughs) And was this a full-on kind of rocking electric band that was playing in the church, or was it something quieter? My mom's church in Batesville, definitely heavy rocking, you know, full in the spirit, that type of joint. But the church in Tutwiler, that was a different, quieter, more intimate type of setting. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I read that your dad was the one who really introduced you to the Delta Blues Museum and the school. Right. Was your dad always interested in music? No, he was not. I think he just saw that I was interested, and he felt like it was cool that that what I was interested in because he, he bought me all type of instruments like keyboards and guitars and He saw something in me to buy all of that for me. So I think, yeah, I think that was the case. And he probably thought this would be a a good way for you to spend your time as opposed to a lot of other things you could get into. Most definitely because my dad, you know, you know, I'm a big guy. He was a big guy around that time. So he played football. So a lot of his peers were like, why you buying him all that? You know, he need to be on the field, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I had no interest in that. Man, I want to play music. (laughs) (laughs) So... I want to ask about your mother, um, who you lost Mm -hmm. to an illness a few years ago. She had a great name, too, Princess Pride. (laughs) And I believe she was a cousin of the country legend Charlie Pride. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, she was. Tell me a little bit about your mom and how she helped you to launch your music career. Well, like I said, out of my mom and dad, Sorry, Dad. She was the musically inclined one. So he got me into the class, but she she kind of pushed me into, like, knowing different styles of music and being diverse. She played everything from the spinners to, like, man, Bon Jovi. And as far as her helping me on my journey, there were different people that we went to along the way to help push me, but, you know, stuff doesn't work out. So when I finally told her that I wanted her to actually manage me, that's when things started doubling down. And she got me to the Rachel Ray show, Steve Harvey show. I was able to, you know, go to a few different countries with her booking me. So, yeah, she was the one that really pushed the envelope out there for me until we got, like, real professional help or whatnot. Now, was she a musician or a performer herself? In the church. In the church. Yeah. There were times where she would, like, get up and sing Ain't No Sunshine in the club, but that wasn't, you know, that wasn't her forte. The church was her thing. (laughs) Yeah, matter of fact, she got slighted a lot when we first started. Because the church people was, you know, me being underage and playing in the club, they didn't like that. So it was kind of uncomfortable in the beginning because of that. (laughs) Well, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, you were playing a lot of bars and blues clubs when you were in junior high and high school. Mm -hmm. How did your mom help you navigate those places? Well, she was the chaperone and she was also the big bad wolf. (laughs) Everybody knew, don't bring no... BS over the Kingfish because she will get to you. 
So that's why anytime time, you know, we went to the club, it was always regulated. Nobody never tried to give me anything or tried to be funny because they knew we don't want to feel Princess's wrath, you know, so. So she really protected you because, you know, some of those places you probably weren't even starting to play until nine or 10 o'clock at night. Oh, yeah. Yeah. My first gig, man, lasted six hours. It went from <laughs> two, like, yeah, six to 12 in the morning, one, something like that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I was playing bass at the club. Yeah, that's pretty late for a ninth grader. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> <laughs> so your mom also got you through some pretty tough times. I heard her reference uh, bouts of homelessness. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like for you? And what did you kind of learn from your mom getting through some difficult times? Well, that happened around the time I heard my dad split. He wanted me to go with him, but I didn't want to leave my mom, so I stayed with her. And things got tight. And we were homeless for a very brief time, but anytime you don't have a, a home to call your own, you're homeless. You know, we lived in a, you know, spotty hotel. And I still went to school. It, it was, like I said, it was brief us for a month, but, you know, we went through it. And seeing how strong she was and dealing with that and struggling to, like, pay the hotel fee, every, trying to book the show with me. At this time, I'm still a side man as well. I'm not doing my own thing. So, like, seeing her navigate through that is kind of what pushed me, you know, to go to the music and try more harder, you know. Yeah. So, Kingfish, you played all these incredible covers when you were a kid, and, you know, you can still see a bunch of them on YouTube. I mean, Purple Rain and Hey Joe and The Thrill is Gone. When did you start writing music? Honestly, I started writing my own music around those times. I just didn't have enough confidence to like perform some of my own stuff because I didn't have confidence in my own stuff. But the first song that I actually wrote that I had confidence in was like age 15 and 16. And it was uh, outside of this town. And from that point on is really when I started to double down on like my writing and understanding, you know, songwriting and whatnot. Yeah. You came out with a beautiful song called Rock and Roll as a tribute to your mom. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how she made a deal with the angels so you could sell your soul to rock and roll. Um, talk to me about that song and uh, how it came together. We did a show in Nashville shortly after we had uh, just buried her. And uh, my manager, Rick, came to me with these two songwriters in Nashville by the name of Ashley Ray and Sean McConnell. And they had this song called Rock and Roll. And um, she was talking about her mom. So we got it and we were able to switch up a couple of things. Like I said, in the song, she was saying her mom made a deal with the devil. Well, not just metaphors, but with my mom being churchy, you know, and everything. We was like, yeah, she made a deal with the angels. So it worked out perfectly. And it turned out to be a beautiful tribute. Go, baby, sell your soul to rock and roll. Yeah, baby, sell your soul to rock and roll. She made a deal with the angels and they never let go. So I could sell my soul to rock and roll. It's a great song. It's a beautiful song. And what a wonderful tribute to your mom. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be back with more from Kingfish after the break. Welcome back to Biscuits and Jam from Southern Living. I'm Sid Evans, and today I'm talking with the blues prodigy known as Kingfish. When you think about a cook in your family who stands out, who comes to mind? Was it a, a grandmother or an aunt, one person in particular? I would say my Aunt Clara. That's who was actually taking care of my mom up until her death. All the get-togethers are really primarily at her house. She's like one of the premier, if not the premier cook in the family. <laughs> so I want to ask you about Clarksdale, and I know you're traveling all over the world these days, but what are some of your favorite places to go when you go back to Clarksdale? Are you talking about like food spots? Yeah. There's a spot that's right before you get to my house, a spot called Kinoas. It's a guy, he's been around there for years. You know, your local fish burger wing joint. One of my classmates' parents 
had a place called Owen Soul Food. Uh, they recently just closed, but that was like the number one spot in town that everyone would go to. A lot of the famous rappers from the city would come back, go eat there. It was, yeah, it was it was it was a mom and pop spot, but they had best food. Those are like the two places that I definitely would go back to. You know, the mom and pop Chinese spots, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. When you think of a family dish, like something that you miss when you're away and you've been on the road for a long time, what's something that you really kind of look forward to when you get back home? Their mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing else. Yeah, that might be hard to find in Australia or uh <laughs> Yeah, you can find it, but it ain't gonna be like <laughs> it ain't gonna be like it is over here, you know. Right. Yeah, right. like there's no Velveeta. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a great place in Clarksdale called the Ground Zero Blues Club, which probably feels like playing in your living room to you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've played all over the world. You've opened for the Rolling Stones. You've played in front of huge crowds. What does that place mean to you? Uh, well, it was one of my old stomping grounds. It was one of the places that gave me an opportunity to get on stage and showcase my talent, even when I probably didn't deserve to it at a certain time. That's what it means to me is home. Yeah. If someone's looking for a really great juke joint, if they really want to hear the sound of the Delta Blues other than that club, where else should they go? Is there a certain place that you love to play? Oh, yeah. The first club I did my first gig at, it was actually in sixth grade, a place called Red's Blues Club, probably the most authentic, if not the most authentic juke joint in, you know, in the North Mississippi Delta. It's been around for years. That's where I cut my teeth at and play probably thousands of shows there. Like, that's authentic as you can get. Yeah. Kingfish, you're not just a guitar player. You're a singer. And you have this powerful voice that has all kinds of range. Thank you. And there are a lot of great guitar players out there, but not all of them can sing. <laughs> How have you tried to kind of grow and develop as a singer over the years? It was actually kind of crazy because I just started to work on my singing as just much as my guitar playing. I'm learning how to use melodies more, trying to increase my range, vocal range. And also, just like I listen to many different guitar players, I try to study different vocalists as well. Different vocalists outside the blues, but may have like blues background flavor like Patti LaBelle, Luther Vandross, Erica Badu, you know, singers that are out of my forte. Yeah. Hell, even um, Pavarotti. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's out of the box for sure. <laughs> right, right. You recorded a song called Fresh Out with the blues legend Buddy Guy, and y'all have spent a lot of time together on stage and probably traveling on the road. What are some things that you've picked up from playing music with him? Each time I'm on the road with Buddy, is, is always a different lesson every night. How he has the crowd like in the palm of his hand, how he controls them with just a lick how he phrases different, you know, words or whatnot, just it's always a master class. That's the biggest thing for me. I've gotten other lessons from him, different stories about, you know, times on the road or, or whatnot. But for me, like seeing how he just worked the audience and takes control of them has always been a big lesson for me. Well, that must have been a really special moment to record that song with him. Oh, yeah. It wasn't a duet-like thing. You know, I had it already recorded before he got on it, but for him to like even – Consider getting on it with me. It was a hell of a thing for sure, for sure. Yeah. I want to ask you about your most recent album, 662, which came out last year. And anyone from North Mississippi knows that 662 is the area code down there. And I love how the title track is this sort of rocking tribute to your hometown. What can you tell me about that song and how it came together? We were at home in quarantine, you know, from COVID, had just gotten off the road or whatnot. And it was like, okay, this will be perfect time to do another record. So I got with uh, Tom Hambridge and uh, Richard Fleming, and we did Zoom sessions all the way from May to, like, September, just writing songs. And uh, I wanted to have a song that showcased, you know, my city, because I did the song outside this town, but I wanted to have a song about home. So... I wanted to showcase all the other parts of the blues that people don't talk about, like churches being on every corner, people, you know, warming up their cars to go to work, people chilling on the porch, talking smack and drinking and whatnot. The neighborhoods, all of that is just part of the blues as, you know, anything else. Yeah, that's home, right? Most definitely. I come from a river town, talking about home. 
So, Kingfish, you've been called the future of the blues by some folks, and you won a Grammy for your first album. What are some things that you hope for when you think about your own future and the kind of music that you want to play? I just want to show people that uh, young kids, especially young African-American kids, are still into traditional styles of music, still into the blues. If it wasn't for the blues, it wouldn't be everything that's popular today. I want to show that because for years... I've had to listen to the myth that, you know, all young black kids like whatever's new. No, that's not the case. I want to show that, you know, this is our blues. I want to add, you know, old timey blues with the new stuff to show like this is our blues of today. So that's my mission right now, at least one of them. Well, you're just reaching more and more people all the time. So I I think they're listening out there and there's going to be a whole crew of young Kingfish fans turning into blues guitar players before you know it. (laughs) Oh, I hope so. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Kingfish, I just have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to be Southern? Ooh, man, what does it mean to be Southern? I think I have a better advantage at understanding more about the blues because it comes from down, down there, but I think what people know about Southern hospitality, you know, the niceness, the uh, coolness, the all around friendly, you know, Mississippi vibe. I think that's what great about being a Southerner for sure. Well, Chris Stone, Kingfish Ingram, thank you for being on Biscuits and Jam. Oh, man. Thank you for having me, man. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Chris Stone, Kingfish Ingram. Southern Living is based in Birmingham, Alabama, where I record all of these interviews. Be sure to follow Biscuits and Jam on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And we truly love your feedback. If you could rate this podcast and leave us a review, we'd really appreciate it. I want to thank Chrissy Tiglius, Mel Inman, Jennifer Del Sol, Lottie Le Marie, Dominique Arciero, and Brennan Long for everything they do to make this podcast happen. I also want to thank all of our amazing guests for sharing their stories, their traditions, and their music. And thank you for listening. There's a lot more coming in 2023, so stay tuned and have a very happy new year.